All right, I think I have my slide shared. Um, and, and excuse me, you heard a little bit about our communication throughout the, the day today um, and what we're going to be chatting about in this webinar um, is uh, features on the OSF um, for talking about discovery in a few different ways. And this particular um, event is uh, focusing on tracking and reporting uh, funded research plans and outcomes. Um, so I, I know I can see just from the chat here that we have a number of funder representatives, um, and then probably a number of you that are that support funded research at your institution and and other in other ways. Uh, now all of you are are welcome, and we'll have some things that uh, I think you'll you'll learn here. Um, there is also an, another webinar next week, I believe, um, and we can put the date in the in the chat, and that one is more focused on that institutional um, persona, but you'll see a lot of connections between all of these. Um, so thank you for, for joining us today um, in advance. Um, so you'll be hearing from me today mostly. I'm uh, the product manager here at, at COS. And um, you know I'm a I'm an open book, so my contact info is here. If you anything that you see today or uh, seem related to uh, OSF or beyond the OSF, please do uh, feel free to reach out to me. I'm um, always uh, in welcoming new communications and contacts and relationships. And you can see what I'm all about and my uh, work and record there, if you like. Um, I'm also joined by a couple of colleagues that are um, staffing the panel here. Um, Amanda, who is running the, the show, um, and then Blaine, who is a, a colleague of mine, who's going to help with, um, you know, following the chat and questions and things. Um, so you can always shoot them notes if you need to as we're proceeding today. Um, it's best if you throw the questions in that Q&A panel because it's easier for us to keep track of those. But as I mentioned, we'll use the, the chat feature um, a little bit as well in just a moment. Um, so what we're going to review today um, is talk a little bit about um, how, as a representing a funder from that perspective, um, how to make the work that you're funding or supporting more discoverable. And this, the same tools and logistics that we mentioned there will be relevant if you're supporting from an institutional perspective as well. Um, a little bit about how that same logic works um, when connecting research across the life cycle. Um, and then I'll we'll tell you a little bit about OSF search features specifically. We just have some brand new stuff that only released a few weeks ago that we're super excited about and is very relevant here uh, and to you. Um, and then I'll actually just live jump into the OSF and show you a couple of these pieces. And um, if you, there's anything as we're going along here, that you want to see, um, and I can show you live. Please do just just ask, and we'll we'll go through that. But all of this, what you're going to see here, is public, so you can play with it as much as you like uh, on your own as well. Um, so just very quickly, uh, if you haven't uh, played with the OSF before or heard of us, um, a lot of what I'm going to talk about today is just generally really good uh, practices and available features that um, whether you're using the OSS specifically or or other tools in the landscape that they're, they're going to apply either way. Um, but the OSF uh, is integrating these features because we find them very valuable and best practice. Um, and where the OSF stands out in a landscape of many, many, many uh, research tools out there um, one, we're, we're free and we're open source. All of our code is completely open and available. If somebody wants to spin up their own version of the OSF, they're welcome to. There's a couple of them actually already out there. Um, there's a version of the OSF running in Japan and one at Los Alamos National Laboratory, just as a couple of examples. Um, but this version of the OSF, all the things that we're going to talk about today is all connected and open. Um, and the the idea, unlike you know a number of the repository tools out there, uh, is that the OSF really wants to support researchers across the entire 
research life cycle all the way from coming up with, you know, their, their study idea and plan uh, all the way to publishing and reporting their results. And I think there's a lot of useful um, features and uh, practices for you um, that I can share with you today. And some of this will be brief, but I have lots of resources that we can share with you about these things um, if you want to get into them some more. Um, and then the other part that you know will have us stand apart from some other tools in our space is where, how do we come up with what we build on the DOSF? Um, you know, how do we prioritize what's new and, and what we support over time? And really, we are are driven by uh, the you know the research community. This very general idea of the many many research communities out there, and slightly more specifically, these three buckets that we work with. Um, we have members and supporters. So we have memberships that. Uh, uh, use some of our service interfaces that are built on top of the OSF that are for research communities like research institutions and um, uh, communities that want to group together their research outcomes or preprints. All of those we have um, interfaces for. So they are a major stakeholder, obviously, in the work that we're doing. We integrate a number of tools across the, the life cycle, storage and preservation and citation managers and, and others coming soon. So that the technology of interoperability uh, is important to us. And we'll see a couple of examples of that shortly. Um, and then obviously those that are coming and depositing uh, research and data and coming and using research and data in the OSF, the, those are major stakeholders for us too. And, you know, we're weighing all of those um, needs across those communities. And, you know, ideally we find places where lots of those needs and um, valuable features are going to overlap. And that dialogue is how we come up with the priorities for uh, the OSF. So we don't just develop tech, toss it out and, oh, well, I wonder if that'll work. Um, it really is a conversation across these stakeholders to build something they're actually very much want to to use um, and would be valuable in, in terms of advancing our you know, mission of transparency and um, openness in, in science, but also their needs as far as their own research cultures. And where that you know intersects with uh, making research, funded research more discoverable is probably a term you hear a lot because um, it's um, it's coming up more and more often um and especially in a space like yours um but just as a as a summary here um one of the the expectations across probably a lot of your organizations and the work you're funding but elsewhere as well is that data and metadata should be fair um and when they say that uh what they're what they're trying to, to get at is that um, the that work should be findable. So the discovery that we're really going to get into today is going to cover a lot of that. Uh, but having identifiers and metadata and indexed in um, in useful locations, accessible so that I can actually get to the things that I find. Um, interoperable, which we just talked a little bit about, and I'll have several examples of. And then reusable so I know how I can actually use the things that I'm finding because it has licenses and information about where it came from and, and how I can use it. Um, and we'll see some examples here, but um, I don't know if I captured any of your organizations that are in the room here uh, in these examples, but this is just a, a couple of of examples that have, have um, you know, come up with even just in the last year or so, or not that they didn't these organizations didn't already operate and with this space, but um, have made changes and, and increased their expectations. Um, like the the NIH here in the U.S. just this year has set um, even more data management and sharing expectations, which is very exciting in our uh, from our perspective. But we know that that can be a little bit um, 
you know, anxiety inducing from a researcher and those that are supporting researchers, because there's a lot that they now have to be accountable for. Um, but a lot of the, the funders are either are following suit or we're even doing this prior to um, in the NIH and others making these announcements, which is also super exciting. Um, so how do we, you know, help you with some of this? And there's pieces that um, are very clearly discussed in those um, compliance uh, policies, like having a data management plan. That that one is becoming more and more um, of an expectation across the, the funder landscape. Um, and researchers are mostly on board with you know, what that means and having good metadata, whether they understand exactly what that means, they understand that they're responsible for it. But then there's all these other pieces that um, you know might be kind of under the surface, could be extremely valuable, but maybe you don't um, seem as clear to the, to researchers or even to those that are setting these policies that um, they could make these more of an expectation, and it just benefits everything else you know, that that is being shared um, before and after the the sort of final outcome of the project, and I'll tell you a little bit about some of these um, here shortly. Um, so let me give you the, the OSF example here. Um, and as I mentioned, a lot of what I'm gonna share with you with the OSF example, doesn't mean that other uh, platforms aren't doing it because there's some really great work in this space happening in other platforms as well. But obviously I'm biased and I think uh, the OSF is, is great and has some really cool tools for you here. And as I get into this, maybe let's use that uh, chat again and just very give me a very brief um, thought on um, as I get into how we can make some of your research funding or the funding uh, funded research that you are supporting uh, more discoverable. Like when you are supporting right now as a program officer or a similar role um, or as an institutional support, What's the part that you get to in somebody's project that you're like, oh man, I have to do this now? Um, like, wh where do you get stuck? Um, and you're not really finding that you have the the resources, or it just is very difficult um, to complete when um, you have to get to that part of uh, the the tracking or reporting or um, other parts of the research support. Um, uh, part of your roles. So if you if you have some thoughts there, just very briefly, just chop, uh, toss them in the chat and we can look at those um, as I go here. Um, so on the OSF, we've had a, a lot of um, metadata, especially at um, each of our object types. And so on the OSF, we have object types that sort of support different parts of um, uh, the research life cycle. And a couple of these I'm gonna share specifically in a little bit uh, for research planning, but there are workflows specifically for that um, that are similar to a data management plan, except talking more about your analysis and not just what you're gonna do with your data. Um, and then also during collaborating and managing during a, pro uh, a project and then sharing and reporting with preprints and other tools. Um, and what we've done pretty well over time is at that level, capturing lots of information to go along with the data that's being shared. Um, so we have data, we have metadata um, for those. Uh, we didn't capture a lot at the file level, so we knew we needed to do some more work there. Um, but there was more opportunities uh, to add some really neat metadata that would support stakeholders like yourselves uh, in the work that you're doing. And so we added this whole new page on those um, object types that capture some, some metadata that we didn't capture before. And to some degree, the infrastructure may not have been uh, you know, prepared for, um, but we're seeing lots of progress. And so a couple of uh, examples here um, is the uh, resource types. We use the data site schema and the resource type um, taxonomy that they've developed, which is a controlled list um, of, that describes the idea being you can describe in just one controlled 
<clears throat> excuse me, vocabulary term, what kind of object is this that I'm referring to um, so that it's easily filterable by you know, just finding things that are in that resource type. Um, so this isn't a something that I just type in and you know may or may not be useful. Downstream, I actually selected this resource type of collection from uh, the data site list. Uh, and then obviously for this audience, the most critical is um, you can now on the OSF, these objects add uh, funding and support information. And I'll actually just demo this in a little bit, um, but uh, critically, the we've integrated the Crossref cross funder registry into this. So um, it's not relying on a researcher that may or may not spell your uh, your funder the, the name correctly so that you have to go and sort that out downstream. Um, they choose from the, the API responses from the Crossref funder registry, their funder, um, and then we include that identifier in the metadata for this object. So once you are querying that identifier, uh, you are going to get that object if I've selected your funder um, and not have to, you want to sort that out later. Uh, so we're really uh, pleased with that addition. And you could add some other, you know, a grant identifier or other information in there as well uh, if you use those. Um, but critically, having that funder data as an identifier um, was really critical uh, from our perspective. And so just summary of some of the other things that we have we have here in this metadata that's available um, is we are mostly for anything that a data site has a um uh schema in the schema has something that can support it we will use the data site schema and that consistency is um uh, really helps with not just when we submit things to data site from the osf but also consistency a lot across lots of, of repositories um, especially with data but other object types as well um, that are sim similarly submitting, uh, creating DOIs and submitting this metadata. So it makes it a lot easier on your side uh, to search for cer specific things because you can use exactly how it's set up um, by data site instead of by many, many different controlled vocabularies and, and schemas. Um, so we use controlled lists for uh, those resource, resource types and the funders that I mentioned but also licenses uh, the subjects, disciplines that the work is in, uh, dates, authors. Um, so you, there's no free text entry of authors um, on the OSF that are associated with profiles. Uh, and that goes for their affiliations as well. So if you use some of those member interfaces that I mentioned earlier um, for your institution, you can add affiliations to uh, the, the author can add their affiliation to their work. And that affiliation comes with uh, the institution's ROAR ID, uh, which is the research organization registry, if you are not familiar with that. Um, and we submit that to, to data site as well. So that same logic of being able to just query that ROAR ID and find everything that's been affiliated on the OSF and elsewhere. Um, so one of those compliance areas that's really um, critical, it was, as we mentioned earlier, is that the expectation now is that not just the specific work that you're supporting, but also the repositories and other tools that um, you would sort of point your uh, researchers to um, is going to be PID ready so that they have identifiers that um, are interoperable with you know, their systems as speaking from the funder perspective, but um, also other systems across the research lifecycle. And I'll show you specifically some examples of this in a moment. Um, but we have a lot of this going on in the, in the OSF already. So we have DOIs for the objects themselves. We have ORCID IDs collected and associated with users and their profiles, uh, ROAR IDs for those affiliations, institutional affiliations, and then the Crossref funder registry for the funders. Um, just very recently, uh, it was announced that the Crossref funder registry is going to start uh, sunsetting over the next you know year or more, um, and the ROAR ID is actually going to take over that function of representing the identifier for a funder 
Uh, so we're already prepared for that when that uh, when we're that's ready to switch over because we already use the ROAR IDs for institutions. So OSF is well prepared um, for that change. Um, that's not something you have to like worry about right now if you're a, a funder, but um, something to think about before too long, uh, making sure you have a ROAR ID and you can send me an email. I can help you with any of that if you're not sure. Um, and then being able to, to connect all of these various pieces across the, the research life cycle. And I'll show you some of that too uh, in a moment. Um, we also created a profile of how all of our metadata works together uh, on the OSF. So you know, if you really wanted to dig in on what kind of metadata we enabled for all of our object types in the OSF and how do those relationships match together within the OSF and elsewhere, we have that all defined uh, and maintained in our application profile. And you can add a lot of this metadata now, even at the file level. Um, we don't mint DOIs for specific files, only these containers, um, but you can add resource types and other specific information to those files. Uh, and then it, we document all of this too, because all of these cool features are only as useful as, um, as a, the user can actually get in and and take advantage of them. Um, so we have lots of documentation on how to use our metadata features, and then we will prompt um, users to to take advantage of those, including, you know, if you you might have had research that you submitted to the OSF years ago, um, but if it was supported by the NIH, like in our example earlier, you can go back and add that now, um, and we will prompt those users to to do so. Um, and you can do the same thing if you have research. Uh, researchers that are using the OSF, you can have them go and add those funder information to their work already. Um, and where that interoperability part comes in is that we, if everything just went into the OSF and stayed there, the utility is, is somewhat limited, but it's not um, just staying in the OSF. It's interoperable across the research landscape. Um, so just in this example here, this is one OSF uh, project, and we can see we have a contributor here that has an ORCID ID. We have data site um, resource types that were filled in. We have a funder in this case, uh, NIH, and even some award, specific award information that was submitted. And when a DOI was minted for this object and was all sent to data site, on the data site here, we can see the some of those specific fields like the license information and the language. Uh, and the object types that were uh, submitted from the project. We can see the ORCID ID and the profile, the author information. We can see the institutional affiliation here and that the uh, funder ID for NIH that was submitted as the funder. So all of that now is all captured in data site and those relationships could be indexed here and, and elsewhere just because Nicole, in this case, um, filled in that metadata on the OSF side. So you took maybe a minute and a half to go fill those in. Now all of those are getting picked up. Those metadata are getting picked up on the data site side. She's also synced her ORCID record um, with data site. So now that's getting pushed into her ORCID record as well. So again, she took 30 seconds to set that sync up and now she doesn't have to worry about it. All of the stuff that she submits on OSF and gets a data site DOI is going to sync to her, her ORCID records. Lots of time saved in terms of maintaining um, what her activity is uh, on her ORCID record, which then could get pulled into other systems as she's submitting for new grants or new publications. Um, so there's a lot of value there. And then back on the OSF side, even just a, a search preview, which is what we're seeing here, all of those metadata items, those really critical pieces like the funder, and what the resource type is and the license, all of that, you can just see without even having to open the whole thing up as a search result, you can just quickly see these. Um, and I'll show you a little bit more uh, on the search here in a minute. And I just uh, plugged in this video here because this is just a really quick way to see exactly described, um, you know, when a researcher uh, submits content to us, they have, a funder uh, information that they're submitting to us, their institutional information they're submitting to with their OSF content. We mint a DOI with data site that includes all of that information. And then once that is minted, 
uh, that gets uh, is available now uh, across the landscape, including by querying those raw IDs from the institution and um, the funder ID from the funder in this case, NIH, as well as possibly many, many other um, uh, pieces of metadata that they could query. Um, so that's just a quick look at the same, oops, um, let me skip that slide here, that same process. And then what I wanted to talk about just for a minute is, um, you know, that's just one example of an, an OSF object getting connected to lots of other things externally. Uh, but one of the things we want to enable on the OSF, if we remember this image here about the, the life cycle, is that we don't want you to just, you know, we don't want to enable only just one part of that research, like your you know, research final report or your data that's deposited on the OSF and you've connected all this stuff. That's really great. Uh, but what we also want to enable for you, if you want to use them, uh, analysis, you know, what you intend to do with your analysis and your samples and your hypotheses, all of that, um, you can submit that with all of this metadata and then associate it with your uh, collaboration and data management. And then your initial sharing, like a preprint or other um uh, outcomes, and then a report that you're submitting to your funders. We want you to be able to link all of those together really easily too. Um, and all of that you could do all right now uh, in the OSF. And you could do it from other platforms as too and associate those resources together. So you don't have to use only the OSF. It's not one or the other. Um, but we want to be able to connect all of those for you in the OSF. So that's part that we're really interested in continuing to improve is um, all the way from planning to that report, final report you might get as a funder from your fundees, um, make it really easy for those to all be connected. And you're just getting you know, one identifier that you can then follow and see all of the pieces that you need. Uh, so there's no manual tracking down by trying to find citations of a, your funder in a paper somewhere in free text. We don't want you to have to do that anymore. Um, so just have identifiers that you can just track down very quickly. Uh, and get your results. So uh, OSF is is here to to support you if your if your uh, fundees will submit that metadata. And just just a little bit about that uh, research planning part. Um, and this is a term you may see flying around. And I want to maybe demystify this a little bit. Um, so the the data management planning, as we mentioned earlier, is an expectation now, so that you submit early on in your uh, research process, even as you're submitting your uh, proposals, where's my data going to go? How am I going to share it? What's the policies of the repository that I may be choosing? And that's part of the, the process that a funder would review with the potential project. But there's all of these other things about um, research planning that, you know, is not really taken into account in those steps, uh, but could be really valuable, especially when you think about uh, connecting all of those pieces together with an outcome down the road. Um, and so a pre-registration is that idea. It's that instead of a data management plan, this is your study management plan. What are all the other things that you need to consider and could re you know document? Um, so this is a time-stamped uh, version of your research plan that you submit, and then you can make updates that you justify later, um, but it has a timestamp. It will be public eventually. Um, you can embargo it for up to four years, but the idea is that that always eventually is accessible. Um, so if I publish my paper years later, I can also include my research plan um, and any other details from my funder or, or uh, other supporters. And now I could see what happened at the beginning and at the end, at least, um, of a research project. So that's part of that, connecting those things together. Um, so telling that story, uh, the pre-registration feature is where uh, the OSF is trying to enable that planning part of the, the story. And there's um, some, you know, very research practice specific reasons to do that. Um, and you see sort of publishing trends that are 
uh, we'd like to disrupt um, only because we see that as um, not being conducive to transparent and positive um, research practices. And so if we increase the expectations that things like this, they don't have to be pre-registration exactly, but having research plans be available and transparent, uh, we do more of that or we have that be more of an expectation than we see some of those trends in, in publishing and, and tenure and promotion start to shift a little bit to favor uh, transparency and and um, having your results be shared, whether they are exactly what you thought they were going to be or or seem valuable at the moment. Um, you know, we want those to be shared out of the file drawer, as we say, um, rather than them, them going away. And I'm sure as a funder, um, you would feel the the same way that you don't want just results to be shuffled away because they weren't exactly what was um, you know hypothesized in the initial proposal. So that's really the 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 goal here with pre registration, and then enabling those connections across the the life cycle. Obviously, you need an object for them to connect to, and that's pre registration for us. Um, so yeah, quickly to tell you a little bit about the discovery stuff, and I'm going to show you how this works uh, live because um, I think there's some benefits you can take advantage of right now as a funder uh, with um, OSF search. Um, so things we just added over the last few weeks um, is obviously the having a text matching is is a critical feature. So we've made that even better in our OSF search um, and have some wild cards that have come to be expected um, by those that are searching for research. So those um, you probably would uh, expect to see in most um, research search uh, databases. Uh, but some really cool stuff that we've started to add um, is you can filter by those OSF content types, which you know more or less map to where in the research lifecycle they are representing. Um, and then those filters on the identifiers for the funder, uh, most critical to you, and the affiliated institutions. Um, you can filter by those member interfaces that we talked about before, which makes their work more discoverable. And those match um, pretty closely to either their uh, the institution or the just general research community that they're, they're representing. So a very useful uh, filter. Um, and then those relationships to other objects, connected data, papers, and code, um, you could filter to only have results that have those relationships already connected uh, to those OSF objects. So millions of combinations in all of this. Um, and uh, what I'll show you here in just a moment is how we, you can use some of those um, for some of your own, just you know, at a glance reporting purposes. Um, so let me just exit this and go to, uh, this is an example of an OSF project, obviously not the most formal in the world since this is about our uh, lunch menus in the office, but um, I choose this one just because I'm not gonna disrupt anything by uh, demonstrating just a feature here. Um, and this is our funder registry, um, the, the picker uh, for the funder. And um, I think I saw earlier that we had some representatives from, oops, let me help if I can spell, uh, from the Templeton Foundations. Um, and so just as a researcher, I might not know exactly what the name of the, the funder is or how they want to refer to themselves, but I've, I know it's one of these Templetons. Um, and so I start a type ahead here, and then I could choose exactly which one um, I want associated with my uh, with this project. So which which of the Templeton Foundations is supporting my work? There's thousands of, of funders in here. Um, and if yours isn't in there, just let me know. I can help you get that set up. Um, and then if I were to, to complete this uh, and fill in the, the funder and other information, if I have it, now that's all going to be reportable and discoverable both here on the OSF and elsewhere. Uh, that gets that is indexing OSF content like uh, data site. So that's how the, the funding information gets added. It takes a few seconds, as you see there. Um, so prompting your uh, the folks that you fund, as well as, you know, we continue to prompt our users to go and fill those in. 
the burden is very low. Um, so we're really hoping that uh, we can continue to have more and more funder information added um, over time. And then the other benefit of that uh, information getting added is you get to use it um, as a funder. Um, this is all public information. This is our public search page here on the OSF. And you can filter by uh, the funder information that's already added to uh, OSF content. And if you're, we just grabbed the top, um, you know, 12 or 15 uh, in this first list here, but then you can choose specifically your funder um, from that same, it's using the same uh, um, identifiers from the information I was entering on the project level there. Uh, so now if I just want to see what's on the OSF that's public and is funded by the John Templeton Foundation, I can apply that filter and I've got exactly those results. Um, so if I'm representing the, the foundation here, I can get a very quickly, I can get a, a look at what um, is already on the OSF and has that identifier added to it. And so if, if that's an expectation that I have of my um, of the researchers I'm funding. And um, Andrew said he was gonna deposit his things and make it public and have the identifiers on, on the OSF. I can come and verify that in, in 10 seconds, uh, whether he's done that already. Um, and then if you wanna take advantage of more of those uh, additional filters, like uh, which provider, um, one of those community interfaces they might be um, submitted to or which licenses they've put on it, um, which disciplines they've included. And we have many others that just um, the Templeton, any of the Templeton projects haven't added some of the other relationships here. Um, but if they had, all of those filters would also be available. Then you can see the, the badges here, which represent whether they've connected any of those additional resources just at a glance, you can see those. Um, there's the search previews that we mentioned before. Um, so just in a few seconds, I've gotten a quick um, understanding of what um, I have supported from the John Templeton Foundation in this case um, that is on the OSF and is public and can review these and you know determine if the um, expectations have been met um, that I have put on my um, fundees that have determine they want to use the USF. So we're really excited about um, how easily easy that is for you uh, or folks like you to take advantage of. Um, and if there's feedback for us on how we can make that even easier or have things that um, can map closer to what your specific policies are, uh, then we do want to talk to you about that. Um, so certainly um, come and send us a, a note. Um, before I get into just QA time here, one of the things I do want to mention is some upcoming work that we have um, for additional metadata. Uh, so we're going to integrate a tool uh, called the CDAR um, Embeddable Editor. And, and what the, the CDAR tool does already is um, you can go to their um, workbench and for your specific research community, um, define as complex a metadata schema as you need uh, to describe the, the data or other output type um, that you're submitting to a repository. Um, and the value there being that that could be very different than the, some of the general metadata items that we're collecting on the OSF currently. And so what we will do is um, enable researchers to go to that same metadata page uh, and then actually load up one of those very specific templates, fill in that schema, and then we put those those responses into that same metadata page. And some of the discovery works differently than our uh, default metadata would, um, but we do want all of it to be findable and readable along with that uh, OSF object. So we think this is really a valuable tool for um, folks like yourselves that fund within specific disciplines that the sort of default metadata doesn't get to everything that you would want to see, this would uh, enable that. So um, we expect this work to, to be released early next year. Uh, and again, we'd, we'd love your, your feedback um, if you have some thoughts there. So 
as I wrap up um, and get into some questions, I see some questions already um, piling in. Uh, none of what you know I got into today is um, you as a funder or the researcher support roles. You don't have to take on all of that all at once, especially things if you've never heard of it before, like uh, pre-registration. Um, but taking on some of this, uh, and a lot of the funders are already doing things like the the identifiers. We just want to support you there. Um, and if moving into more of these other spaces is something you want to do, we really want to enable that for you and help you do that. But um, the where you are is where we want to to support you. Um, so don't feel like if you're not doing everything that I mentioned that you know I don't want to associate with you because that's not clear. That's not the case at all. I really want to work with you wherever wherever you are uh, in your policies and research support. Um, so come and talk to us about any of this at all. I uh, would love to hear from you. So I'll leave this uh, sort of resources page here open while I jump into the chat and QA here. All right. Um, Christo uh, submitted a question. How to comply with data that can be open access, but is under an IRB that should be clean of identifiers? Yeah, good question. Um, so there are repositories that, uh, especially when you get into like participant data, things like that, um, that if you've described what your cleaning process is and it's still needs to be in a HIPAA compliant environment, the OSF is not that. Um, so as much as I want you to come and use the OSF, um, that I would tell you to, to ask your institution or, or other resource, what do you have available uh, that is HIPAA compliant um, for submitting that work uh, because you wouldn't want to submit it to the OSF. Um, now, if you've made as part of your process, that that cleaning is really going to do to remove um, all of that kind of critical information, and it can be in uh, a repository, generalist repository like the OSF. Um, then certainly that would would be an option. But I think you would probably want to talk to um, your library or research to support to see where your project falls um, on what you've committed to you and and what's going to be shared. So I hope that's helpful, uh, Christo. Um, he actually has another question here. Uh, recognize standards for metadata um, with Dublin Core and implications for institutional repositories. Yeah, that's a great question. And um, that's exactly what um, the application profile um, is uh, is prepared to answer for you. I can actually grab this link for you because it's all, oops, um, it is all public, our uh, application profile. Um, and it, it in that profile tells you um, which of the sort of metadata taxonomies and schemas that um, that we have gone with for our, you know, each of the relationships and then what that maps to as far as the, the standards. Um, so as I mentioned, there's a lot of um, mapping to data site schema and practices, um, but there's others in there that you'll see um, Dublin Core and other um, associated standards. Uh, so this is probably, oops, wrong menu here. Um, the resource that you want. So let me, I just send it. It's in the QA with uh, Christo's question. I'll put it in the chat here too. Um, and we maintain that on the, the product team. Uh, so if you have any questions about this at all, we have a, a metadata expert who is a librarian um, on our team specific and, and part of her role is maintaining this uh, profile. And she would love to, to talk to you if you have um, questions or, or suggestions on that. So please do um, reach out to us. We would love to love to talk to you about um, any questions or thoughts you have there. 
Um, question about the slides being shared after. Um, yes, absolutely. We will share the slides, the recording, and then uh, a number of the resources that we referred to or we shared in the chat. Um, all of those will um, get shared in, a, in an email uh, follow-up that will come out in the next day or two. Um, so to keep a lookout for that um, and that you know, we don't have to stop our uh, conversation there. Um, if you do want to continue to have, um, you know, want to meet with us and talk about some of the things you're working on as a funder or as an institutional rep, um, we would love to do that. So please do, um, you know, follow up on that email or just shoot me a, a note personally and be happy to set that up. Um, but yeah, you will definitely get feedback uh, or you will get a follow up um, in the next few days. Um, we got a question in the chat. If I recall correctly, data site metadata schema is based on Dublin Core. Um, I don't remember exactly which part. Um, yeah, there's a lot of the of the fields where that you know, makes perfect sense to map it to um, to existing standards like uh, Dublin Core. There's also some things that data sites trying to do that don't map um, to an existing standard, so they sort of become the de facto standard for some of those, particularly when we're talking about relationships with other object types. Um, so you'll, um, that, that you would see that in the uh, metadata profile that I, I linked in in the uh, chat um, where some of those might uh, diverge. Um, but yeah, you'd see a lot of relationship between the uh, Dublin Core standards and data site and, and others, of course, um, Dublin Core being um, a very, very valuable standard. All right, we're running low on time. Any other questions or um, things I can show you? I have a, a request, I'd be happy to, to look at it with you. Um, let me put the link to the search if you wanna just play with that. Um, so I mentioned all of this is completely open to you. Um, one thing I'll actually release in the next uh, week or so um, is if you were to set one of those um, filters. So, you know, if you're representing uh, the NSF, you could set this uh, funder filter up, and then um, you know any of these other additional filters stack them up as needed. So if I only wanted data sets that were funded by the NSF. Um, and have a, a CC4 license. For example, if this was my critical uh, intersection that I needed to be reporting on as an NSF, as one of the program officers, um, there will be a URL. Right now, you'll see this URL hasn't changed as I've added filters. Um, but that next release over the next week, um, each time you add a new filter, We'll update the URL so you just you know complete the filters you want, copy the the URL, and you just kind of put it in your notes. Um, and then each time you needed to see those updated results, you just click on that URL. It'll put those same filters in and update the the results. So again, in a, you know a second, you'd be able to see what kind of um, uptake you've seen with funded by NSF is data set has this license. Uh, just by clicking that link. Um, so we think that'll be really useful for you uh, and others. Excuse me, um, having that as a resource. All right. I don't see any other questions coming in, um, but thank you for joining us. Uh, and if you have other questions or um, requests or things you want to chat with us about, please do reach out to me and to the, our team love to hear from you and talk to you so thanks again and if uh if i see you again next week for the the next webinar um be excited to have you for that one as well all right thank you again